All right, I think it's about that time. We've got another minute or so. So um, yeah, so we're gonna start off today, like uh, someone asked the last time for like a little bit of kind of like a, I don't know, like overview of, you know, control. Um, so I'm gonna try to do that today uh, and sort of give you like a, a little bit of a historical view and um, I don't know, survey, let's say of, of topics in this kind of, in the whole field. And um, I don't know, you know, hopefully that's interesting. And uh, see, can I make this go away? I don't know. I think we have to live with that too, unfortunately. Unless anyone has any suggestions for making this bar disappear. I don't know. Okay, we're gonna live with the bar. I don't wanna figure that out right now. Okay, so, so uh, a brief history of control. So like um, in the beginning, <laughs> Uh, there was the Brachistochrone problem. Has anyone heard of this before? You guys have heard of this? Okay, cool. So this is like really kind of the birthplace of many of the ideas that uh, sort of made their way into modern control theory. And um, for those who don't know what this is, this is uh, the, this question was posed by, I think the, like the Bernoullis and then solved by them and Newton and Leibniz and every famous you know mathematician of like the 1700s that you've ever heard of. And the question is, um, what is the shape of a ramp such that a ball rolling down the lamp, ramp under gravity will get to the finish line the fastest? So you have like some starting point and some end point lower down and to the right stay. And you wanna design a shape of a ramp such that the ball will get to the finish line fastest. And I don't know, yeah, it's not an obvious answer. It turns out the answer is, is a little bit subtle. Does anyone know what the answer to this is? Yeah. Isn't it like you put a point on the edge of the Circle yeah, circle exactly. So, um, so this is the answer. Um, the, it, the, the curve is called a cycloid and it's exactly what you just said. You take a point on the rim of a circle and roll the circle around and that that's the curve. It turns out that's the optimal shape. And like, it's not an obvious thing at all. Um, so, so several of those, you know, those famous guys came up with the solution, the right answer, but Newton's solution in particular, um, kind of like anticipated and kicked off a bunch of the mathematical ideas that led to modern control. Um, in particular, he, in, as part of his solution to this thing, he kind of invented this idea called the calculus of variations. Have you guys, who's heard of that? Show of hands. Yeah, so I'm gonna steer clear of that in this class uh, for the most part, is we're gonna sort of take a little bit different tack, but basically calculus of variations is this idea of optimizing over functions. So in this case, the function is the shape of the ramp, right? And like you're minimizing some cost function where the argument there is a function uh, itself, right? And so this is kind of the classic solution of this guy. Uh, oh yeah, that's what the next slide was, right? So it turns out um, this isn't just useful in control, it shows up in a lot of places. It shows up in statics, it gives you the shape of a chain, a hanging chain, which is another classic problem. Uh, it shows up in optics for math principle. Uh, which is like the path of light rays through materials. Uh, it shows up in classical mechanics. This is actually how you get like Hamilton's principle, euler Lagrange equations, like Lagrangian mechanics. It's how you get that stuff. Uh, shows up in finite element methods, uh, general relativity, quantum mechanics, like all, all this stuff. It's, it's actually quite ubiquitous and sort of all over the place. And, and that's sort of the canonical form right there. So you're like minimizing some cost function J with respect to some function of time, AKA trajectory X of T. And like the ideas here, are like generalizing kind of the standard optimization ideas that we've talked about so far, where you like say would want to take the gradient of that and set it equal to zero kind of idea. How do you take the gradient of J with respect to X of T, right? So you're taking the gradient of a function with respect to another function and that gets weird. And that's kind of calculus of variations in a nutshell. Okay, so this is sort of old, old, you know, 1700 stuff where some of these ideas originally started. Um, then moving forward in time, does anyone know what this thing is? This is more fun control history. So this, this is called a centrifugal governor. This, um, uh, and it was invented, I think by James, James Watt, like the steam engine guy. And this thing, what it does is it spins around uh, and those two masses sort of get pulled out under centrifugal force. Uh, and this thing controls the throttle valve on a steam engine to regulate it at a constant RPM under different loads. So the, basically the rate at which that thing spins makes those, those balls go up and down. 
uh, on those arms, and that um, like uh, opens and closes the, the throttle valve and regulates it at a constant RPM. Kind of cool. So this was invented in like the late 1700s as part of you know steam engine industrial revolution, uh, but no one really mathematically analyzed how it worked until uh, uh, the late 1800s. And the guy who did that was James Clerk Maxwell uh, of Maxwell's equations from electricity and magnetism from your sort of physics courses. He also could be the, considered like the father of feedback control theory. Uh, so he analyzed this in terms of like kind of linearizing and eigenvalues and stability and all, all the stuff you know from like kind of classic sort of SISO control. He, he did that on this problem and was kind of the first guy to do that stuff. Um, incidentally, the original paper from 1868 is on the internet and surprisingly readable. And like, it's kind of worth a Google at some point if you're uh, into that sort of thing. So this is kind of, this kicked off like feedback, what's called classical feedback control, like these kind of frequency domain ideas. And that kind of continued up through the first half of the 20th century and got um, used in all kinds of things, you know, sort of early 20th century, you had uh, the first autopilot uh, for an airplane, which was like 1914, which is that picture over there. Um, by a guy named Sperry, who went on to fund, found a company that's super famous that I think the remnants of it are still around. Uh, also, automatic steering for ships was done around this time. And um, in no, like the teen years, there was no theory. People are just kind of like doing stuff and trying it out. Uh, but it was mostly like PID control, essentially. But there was no general theory of how to do it. The general theory started to come in the 19, 1920s to try to analyze this stuff and come up with stability analysis and prove things weren't going to blow up and stuff like that. Seems nice. And that really came from the electrical engineering communities. So the, the feedback amplifiers in, in EE land and vacuum tube amplifiers and for radio and stuff like that. And that in the 1920s there, when the theory kind of formed around this stuff, this was when you got all the classic frequency domain tools you guys might've seen in like an undergrad feedback control class. So like um, Laplace transforms, Bode plots, root locus, all that stuff was done in the like sort of late 20s, early 30s and um, Nyquist stability, right? So that was 20s, 30s. And then um, World War II came and it sort of exploded again. There was like a lot of use of this stuff in you know, guidance systems for torpedoes and missiles and all this kind of military stuff in, in World War II. Uh, so that's sort of first half of the 20th century, what you would call classical control. Then um, post-World War II, sort of 1950s, 1960s, um, you started to see what, what is now called modern control. Uh, and this is, really what this refers to are state-based methods where we use uh, sort of matrices and a lot of linear algebra and do things in the time domain, which is like what we're all about in this class for sure. Um, the real sort of father of that whole line of work was Rudolf Kalman of the Kalman filter um, in the sixties. And um, really like, yeah, he kind of brought linear algebra, I would say into control theory. And um, kind of really the impetus for this was that uh, this is when computers could start doing linear algebra for you. So like pre this period, like all that classical control first half of the 20th century stuff was all done by hand with like, you know, log paper and graphs and stuff. And now in the sixties, you started to actually have computers that people could use to do this kind of stuff. So hence linear algebra kind of becoming important. Um, in fact, yeah, does anyone know the story of like the original column filter paper? It got rejected like multiple times and he couldn't publish it anywhere <laughs> for like a long time, which is kind of funny. Uh, and then the real kind of breakthrough to this stuff becoming used and popular and all that was in the late 60s in the Apollo program. Um, essentially, uh, they needed it to do Apollo. And the extended Kalman filter was actually invented by uh, a guy named uh, Stanley Schmidt, who was working at NASA Ames, who they basically tasked him with figuring out how to navigate to the moon. And like he read Kalman's paper somehow and like went up for the weekend and came back with the answer. And it was like an extended Kalman filter. And they, in fact, he invented the EKF and the sort of square root Kalman filter, which you may have heard of, uh, to get it to work on the really crap computer, the Apollo guidance computer. Um, so that's kind of that the 60 story, sort of in parallel with this, which we're going to talk about hopefully later today. Um, uh, there was a lot going on in the Soviet Union, right? The Russian space program at that time as well. A guy named Lev Pontryagin did a lot of work um, on uh, trajectory optimization, kind of laid the mathematical foundations for a lot of trajectory optimization. Specifically, he developed what's called Pontryagin's minimum or maximum principle, which we're going to talk about, which you may have heard of, which are really just the first order necessary conditions for, for a trajectory optimization problem. They're like the KKT conditions of trajectory optimization. Uh, we might do those later today. Uh, and then in the US, you had also another big name is Richard Bellman around the same time, late 50s, 60s, doing dynamic programming. 
which a lot of you probably heard of, right? Uh, cool. So that sort of was 60s. Um, and then let's see, what else happened? These, yeah. So, and really all that stuff it was the application motivation was largely the space program, both here, right, with Coleman and, um, and Bellman, and then in, in Russia with Contriog. And a lot of it was trying to figure out how to fly rockets and go to the moon and that kind of stuff, which is kind of cool. Uh, okay. So, and also deeply tied to the existence of computers at that point was what let people do fancier things, right? Okay, so next kind of interesting set of ideas and uh, uh, that sort of kind of came around uh, in this time too, in the starting in the 50s, I don't know if this is gonna play now, which is annoying, um, adaptive control, who's here of this? Okay, so this is kind of interesting. It, it started in the 50s and the idea was like, you had unknown parameters in your model or you had parameters that were hard to measure or estimate and um, might be time varying, might be changing on the system, right? And originally where this came from were advanced aircraft. Uh, and there are some famous examples in the late 50s, early 60s on, on high performance aircraft. Um, uh, this is the X-15, if anyone's heard of that, where they famously kind of tried some things that didn't go so well and crashed a few of these, um, not great. And um, basically the idea here is essentially what they were doing back then was online gradient descent on the control parameters while you were flying the airplane. And they didn't have good theory at the time. And uh, they just tried a lot of stuff. And unfortunately, some people died. Not great. Um, but, but yeah, so th this actually, the, the line of work there kind of you can trace right through to the modern era of, of like kind of um, online learning in RL. Like the, the ideas are really similar. And so adaptive control and like these kind of current state of the art results on like um, online learning for, for say like a locomotion are, are sort of historically very related and kind of interestingly intertwined. Uh, yeah, I would say really the, the difference between these two pictures is really computing has gotten better, right? And we can do bigger things with more, more parameters and stuff now. Uh, cool, okay, so that's adaptive control. Then the sort of like next thing to talk about is robust control, who's heard of this? Okay, so this is maybe the, the most badass title and abstract of a control theory paper ever. Who, who's seen this before? This is the famous John Doyle paper. So this came out in 1978. And essentially before this, people thought that sort of LQR controllers and these nice optimal control ideas uh, were kind of naturally robust to errors in your system model and things like this. And there were some proofs that led people to kind of believe that should be the case. Um, but then, um, uh, Doyle, and I think this was like his first paper as like a first year grad student or something insane like that. Um, he found a couple of like really nice, simple counter examples where for like infinitesimal perturbations in the A and B matrices of your linear dynamics model, uh, the system would go unstable and then blow up. And so that's what this paper was. <laughs> so the title is guaranteed margins for LQG regulators. So LQG, for those who don't know, is a Kalman filter hooked up to an LQR feedback controller. Um, and we're going to do that later in the course. And the abstract is there are none. And, uh, and then the, the paper is actually super short. It's like a note. And he just lays out a simple little like two by two linear system with like a little epsilon in it and shows that when you compute the, you know, the controller for this, you know, for, for like basically infinitesimally small epsilon perturbations on the elements of the matrix, it blows up on you, which is kind of cool. So that spawned an entire research area of robust control starting right around then that, that kind of blew up and, and got really big in the 80s and into the you know early to mid 90s and the whole game there um when we say robust control this kind of stuff it's all still linear control what they were specifically doing was kind of trying to find extensions of of lqr ideas where you could guarantee closed loop stability under like bounds on the on the a and b matrices in your linear system so say you would say something like okay here's my a matrix nominal a matrix here's my nominal b matrix I'm going to bound the elements or I'm going to bound the, the matrix, you know, um, and I want to find a controller that will get, be guaranteed to be stable for any actual instantiation of A and B within those bounds. So that's robust control. Um, the kind of, you know, there's this interesting trade off between robust and adaptive, where uh, adaptive is trying to figure out what the exact parameters are online, whereas robust is ahead of time trying to guarantee things won't go south on you online. Um, the, the kind of interesting thing is that, you know, when you do robustness stuff, you're kind of intrinsically always giving up some performance in exchange for the robustness, right? Okay, so 80s up through the 90s, this was really big. Still some people work on this stuff. Um, 
more fun stuff. So this is getting more modern and more kind of state of the art now. And I don't know why the videos aren't playing in this thing. Sorry. Um, what you should see in that video is a quad rotor doing crazy things uh, from like 10 years ago. And uh, this is called model. So who's heard of model predictive control? I mean, most of you guys, this is currently kind of where we're at in robotics largely. This is like uh, super popular and, and super widespread now. So the idea here is you're basically solving the optimal control problem numerically online. Uh, you're using an optimizer, you're solving this problem. And if you can solve it fast enough, i.e. at like tens or hundreds or even kilohertz uh, online on the robot, then you can just do that and use that as your feedback law. And you just kind of keep resolving the whole optimization problem online. This only became possible, you know, kind of semi-recently. It started in like the late seventies in chemical engineering where they were doing this stuff on chemical plants. And the reason it started there was because chemical plants have really slow dynamics. So like you can run the, um, the controller at like once per minute update rates. So you have tons of time to solve your optimization problem. So as soon as like desktop PCs became a thing in like the late seventies, they basically started doing this in, in chemical process engineering. And then it started to kind of move into more and more fields as computers got better and faster. And now it's used everywhere. And it's kind of one of the standard, standard things to do. And we're gonna do a bunch of this. Um, that's that. Uh, sort of parallel things that are relevant to us that, you know, uh, one is kind of what's, what happened in robotic manipulation, specifically like industrial robots. There's a bunch of classical stuff in here that's um, not control theory or feedback control per se. Um, but essentially what, what goes on in these things is you write down the dynamics, like the manipulator equation, like there. And it turns out, even though this is like a weird, crazy nonlinear system, you can do some really simple math and basically invert the dynamics. And so if you have a given Q of T that you want the end effector to, you know, that you want the robot to track, you can literally just invert the dynamics and figure out what the U of T is that should give you the Q of T open loop. And then you kind of like wrap a tight PD loop around this or something. And this was kind of how people figured out how to do industrial robots back in like the seventies and eighties. Um, then kind of similar, like, you know, robotics e developments, uh, legged robots started in the eighties with two like really interesting, really different approaches. One approach was kind of the, the Honda approach in Japan, which is kind of the bottom right picture. Um, and this used really these, these ideas. They tried to treat the legged robot like an industrial arm and use these kind of dynamic inversion techniques. And, um, because of that, uh, you get sort of the very classic stereotypical walk like a robot vibe. Uh, at the same time, you had the leg lab, which started here at CMU with Mark Rabert and then moved to MIT and then became Boston Dynamics um, starting like this, this period in the 80s. And they kind of used very different techniques that were based on a lot of like intuition about the dynamics, but were basically really reasoning about the kind of full floating base dynamics of this legged thing and, and doing like really crazy dynamic things. This video from the eighties is them doing a backflip on this like hopper robot, which is kind of awesome. Um, and yeah, that's sort of that. Let's see what else is in here. And okay. So yeah, Boston Dynamics-y things. What are, what are, oh, so this is like more recent, right? Like kind of legged robot stuff and what's changed basically um, the whole field has kind of moved more towards the Mark Rabert uh, use lots of dynamics kind of uh, uh, ideas and um, kind of abandon that like manipulator sort of industrial robot style control and basically merge those original Mark Rayford ideas with MPC is kind of what's happened more recently. And that you can see that like literally in, in all these robots in, in MIT Cheetah, which is the lower right one. Um, and, and sort of obviously the Boston Dynamics stuff has that heritage, uh, but um, there's, there's literally sort of an MPC controller in, in Cheetah and underneath it, a bunch of things borrowed straight from that uh, 1980s Ray, Mark Raybert hopper stuff. It, uh, there's a bunch of sort of things. There's this thing for footstep placement called the Raybert heuristic that's in there. And so it's really kind of just coming together those, those early 80s ideas uh, with a lot of intuition about dynamics and MPC is kind of where we're at now, I would say. And then kind of to finish this up, like where are interesting challenges now, if you want to like get into this field. Um, one big one is dealing with contact in like legged locomotion and manipulation. We still don't have a good sort of like general rigorous theory for this. And there's a lot of hacks to get things to work. Um, another one is kind of like bridging the gaps between model-based control, like we're mostly going to talk about here and kind of data-driven RL approaches. There's still kind of a wide gulf between these communities. And I think there's 
good things on both sides and and you know being fluent in both is probably what you want to do uh, moving forward um yeah and, and so so along those lines yeah can we make the rl stuff more data efficient by incorporating you know models and, and ideas from classical control uh maybe can we give safety guarantees for those rl systems with ideas from you know control theory uh and then finally like an interesting one that that we've kind of gotten into that has a lot of applications and driving among other things is game theoretic control which is like pretty wide open interesting area uh which is like how do you reason about other possibly adversarial you know non-cooperative at least agents which could be other cars when you're driving um bunch of other you know less benign scenarios you can imagine for this but uh, essentially like you know coupled when your control decisions are influencing some other agents control decisions there's coupling it gets weird and interesting and that's sort of a, a pretty interesting area uh, as well okay cool so this is hopefully a little like whirlwind tour of you know the field of modern control and like where it came from questions comments thoughts you don't have anything before you do math Okay, cool. We'll do math now. Uh, yeah, that was that was by request, by the way. So, like, you know, speak up if you want to hear about anything particularly, and, and we'll try to do it. Uh, okay, so what are we going to do today? Today we're going to actually that was sort of timely and appropriate because we're kind of like switching gears. So we've been doing all of this kind of background overview about you know optimization in general and dynamics, trying to get get everyone on the same page. And now we're actually going to do control. So uh, let's see, do my, I do our sort of standard stuff. What did we do last time? Uh, we did what, a bunch of stuff about um, merit functions and regularization and all that good stuff, right? Um, so more like kind of constrained optimization stuff. We did specifically um, uh, this whole like uh, regularization thing with constraints. We did uh, merit functions. We did like line searches with constraints. Did I miss anything? That more or less cover it. All right. And then today we're going to now get into, we did sort of this control history discussion. And then we're going to now sort of uh, dig into, um, first we're going to talk about sort of generic deterministic optimal control. And then um, we're going to talk about the um, Pontryagin minimum principle. And we may get into linear quadratic regulators, TBD based on time. Okay, cool. Let's do it. So, um, first off, let's write down what we mean by deterministic optimal control. So, we're going to spend a lot of time in this general vein. Um, okay, so this is sort of the like canonical setup. First, we're going to do it in continuous time. And so roughly speaking, this is the optimal control problem or the deterministic optimal control problem. It looks like this. So we're minimizing uh, some cost function. That's a function. I'll be a little sort of pedantic about this notation for just a minute here. So we're minimizing this cost function with respect to X and U trajectories. So these are actual functions of time, right? And this cost function has a specific form that's kind of standard. 
So it's the integral along the trajectory from some starting time t naught to some final time t final of this, what we call stage cost. And then you also get this uh, thing we call the terminal cost at the end. That's only a function of the time or the, the, uh, the state, not the control, right? Because at the end, you don't have any more control moves. So there's no you there. Um, and then there's, so it's that, that's the thing we're minimizing and we're minimizing it subject to some constraints. The big one that's always there is we always have dynamics. So you have a dynamics constraint that looks like X dot, you know, equals F of X U like we're used to. And then possibly other constraints, um, which can be, can be like, thrust or torque limits on your actuators, uh, can be obstacle constraints, keep out zones, safety constraints, any of this kind of stuff, can be joint limits, like a lot of, a lot of possible things there, right? Okay, so let's kind of label these things real quick. So um, this stuff is, these are the state and input trajectories. Uh, this is our cost function. And then inside our cost function integral, this guy is called the stage cost, or uh, um, sometimes in discrete time, you'll hear this called the one step cost or step cost. And then this thing is called the terminal cost over here. Uh, okay, this thing is called the dynamics constraint. Uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay, so this is uh, this seems straightforward enough uh, compared to the optimization problems we've been solving. There's like one kind of key difference. Um, that you know is related to all that calculus of variations nonsense we, we mentioned in that like overview. Um, the big difference is that this is a so-called infinite dimensional optimization problem. Uh, does anyone kind of like know what I mean by infinite dimensional? I don't have any thoughts on that. What does that mean? Yeah, like what? What do you? Go on, yeah. What do you mean by parameters and, and that? Well, so let's say I have, uh, let's say I have, I don't know, a quad rotor and it has 12 states. And then I write this problem down for my 12 state quad rotor has 12 states and four inputs, right? Four, four rotors, motors. So that's, uh, so what do you like? Yeah, does anyone have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Is it just as easy to have like any length of trajectory that you're looking at? So here let's, I have a fixed T final, okay. right? So I, and I, so I, I plug in, say, I, I wanna optimize my quad rotors trajectory from, you know, T zero to like T equals 10 seconds. And I have a start state and a goal state, and I have you know twelve states, four controls. I write down a cost function. I write this whole thing down. So what is what is infinite dimensional about that? Yeah. So that's getting into it. Yeah. So this what is meant by this infinite dimensional thing is the following thing. So we're optimizing over continuous functions of time. That's really what this is talking about. And here's where this is quote infinite dimensional. So let's say I have some u of t. It looks like a and in continuous time, right? So this is like this is say this is u of t, this is t, and I like you know write my u trajectory at some curve like this, right? Okay, so when I put this in a computer, I'm going to do my you know zero order hold, first order hold, whatever, and I'm going to have a bunch of sample points on this curve, right? And I'm gonna, you know, sort of discretize this like so, and I'm gonna stack these up into some big, so we'll call it capital U vector. 
that's going to look like this. One to n say, and I've got all these samples in it, right? So I have like u1, u2, dot, 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 un, right? Okay, so, so when, as soon as I discretize and I choose a time step and I sample at that rate, so what did I do here? One, two, three, four, I don't know. Say I, say I have 10 samples at one hertz or something for my quad rotor trajectory. Now, um, now use say 10 dimensional or if it's four inputs, it's 40 dimensional, right? And my problem. But when I go to like continuous time U of T, what that's really talking about is U of T is really the limit of this big U vector of stack sample points as N goes to infinity. Does that make sense? It's like the limit of infinite, infinitely dense sampling in time to get that continuous trajectory. And that's the sense in, in which this is infinite dimensional. Uh, there's some interesting stuff uh, so yeah, U of T is really kind of like limit as N goes to infinity of this like U one to N guy. Uh, so limit of tiny time steps and infinite sample points. Yeah. This might be a dumb question, but why do we optimize across X of T and U of T constrained by the dynamics rather than just optimize across U of T and put a dynamic sense to that? You can absolutely do that. Uh, that is called uh, a, so there's, there's names for that. That's called, that's, that's what you do in a so-called shooting method, single shooting in particular. Uh, and there's sort of very specific numerical reasons why you don't want to do it, which we're going to get into actually super soon. So the, the short answer is that works horribly uh, from like a numerical conditioning perspective. Uh, it is the source of, in machine learning, what is called the like vanishing or exploding gradient problem. And in optimal control is called the tail wagging the dog problem. Basically, when you do that, you have to do a rollout, yeah. right? Uh, you start with X naught and you just have U. So you have to simulate that whole thing forward. What if your system is, and you don't know what U is, right? When you're doing this, what if your system's open loop unstable? What if my system is, you know, like a, a humanoid like me, where if I don't have active feedback control, I fall over. So if I don't know what U is and I'm trying to optimize and I have to do this long forward rollout, say I want to walk from here to there. I have to forward simulate that whole thing with like bad use. It just flails all over the place and, and is garbage, right? And this, by the way, this is very common in, in a lot of RL. This because this is how a lot of the RL algorithms actually do this kind of forward shooting, forward rollout sort of thing. That's the big reason. Uh, if you do it this way, the optimizer basically can independently twiddle X and U. And Let's say I have no clue what the U should be, like joint torques for my humanoid, but I, let's say I have mocap data for an actual human. I can take the mocap data for the real human and put that in as my initial guess for X and get a really nice walking gait as my initial guess with garbage U's. But then the solver like can, can sort of is already in the right sort of part of the state space in the X's and it's much easier to then just dial in the U's. Does that sort of make sense? So having all those variables in there and then constraining them, uh, Gives, the, gives you many, many more degrees of freedom. It makes your gradients a lot nicer uh, and it makes the numerical conditioning better and it makes the problem easier to solve. That was a long-winded, we'll, we'll get more into this, but hopefully that was at least a, yeah, cool, cool. All right, so this is what we mean by infinite dimensional. Um, what else is there to say about this? Okay, so what is the solution to a deterministic optimal control problem? That's the next sort of semi-obvious question. Thoughts on this? If I know everything about everything and I write it down like this and I solve this, what's the answer? So I'll, what it, yeah. It should just be the zero, right? Well, it's, it's a trajectory. Yeah, so if I start at some, some initial state and I have a goal state and I know all the physics and I know everything there is to know about the universe, then the answer to that is just some open loop trajectory that gets me there, right? Because if I know everything, that open loop trajectory will work perfectly, right? So the, the main point here is that if you have a deterministic problem with like no unknowns, the, the optimal solution is just some open loop trajectory. Yeah. Can you clarify what open loop means? Yeah, it means it's just U of T. It means specifically that if I know everything perfectly, I can solve this problem and I'll get some U of T, some control inputs that will drive the system from that initial state to that goal state. I just run it like, you know, as a function of time on the motors and it gets me there, right? And as we all know, real life is not that nice. And there's always uncertainty in the models and noise and disturbances. So if I try that in real life, it just face plants, right? It just falls over and, and breaks. And this is where we get to feedback, 
right? But the, the kind of interesting thing is mathematically in this perfect world of deterministic everything, uh, you don't get feedback policies. You actually just get open loop trajectories that tell you like, if you plug this into the motors, this is where you go. That makes sense to everybody? It's like kind of a, a bit of a subtle point. This is in, in particular in contrast to RL, where a lot of, where everything's stochastic, right? In the stochastic setting, the solutions to optimal control problems are always feedback policies, because they have to be, because if you have noise everywhere, uh, running this thing open loop will not get you where you want to go, right? It'll just kind of randomly wiggle around. Hey, Zach. Zach, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, is it okay if you repeat the students' questions in the audience? Okay. It, it, it's hard for us to hear. Um, on Zoom. Try that. Yeah, I will do that moving forward. Okay, uh, so what else is there to say about this? Okay, so unsurprisingly, uh, there are a handful of problems where you can find analytic solutions to this optimal control problem, namely the linear ones. And then for like anything nonlinear, basically, you know, you need a computer and there's no closed form solution. It's just a, so which is why in this class, we're going to spend a lot of time on numerical methods and algorithms and not a lot of time on analytic theory, closed form solution stuff. Um, And then the last comment is that I wrote this in continuous time, but we're going to basically do everything in this class in discrete time um, because that's what you need to get it on a computer. And, you know, that kind of makes more sense for us, I think. Um, yeah, so basically, all right, any questions about this? I think that's kind of the, okay, cool. So let's do this in discrete time now. So it looks you know, more or less the same and is not surprising at all based on previous conversations we've had. We have some X trajectory where we've sampled it and we have some U trajectory where we've similarly sampled. And then we get a cost function that's a function of these trajectories, sampled trajectories now. And we get uh, our integral turns into a sum so like k equals one to n minus one, we have our stage cough. I have a question, Zach. Yeah. If you, um, if these are open loop trajectories, then if you get an open loop trajectory, can you like track it with another type of controller or something, but that actually makes use of a feedback ball? Yep, yeah, so we're gonna talk about this, but yeah, that's exactly what you do. You use these tools okay. kind of offline. You either do this offline and then track with some other controller online, or you do this online really, really fast uh, and turn it into an MPC controller, that model predictive control thing. So if you can do this really fast, then you can just do it online all the time. And this is kind of it. And that's, that is okay. kind of it, actually. Hmm. But the, and that still doesn't give you a control law, but it's fast enough that well, you're that, able to speaking, If you do this like at 100 hertz on your robot and you just plug in your current X as the X1 every time, and then run the U that comes out of it, uh, that, that gives you a feedback policy. And that's, mm. called, that's what an MPC controller is basically, but it's just solving this problem super fast online. Okay, uh, got it. Cool, okay. So um, yeah, we will do all of these things. Uh, okay, cool. So we have our discrete time dynamics as a constraint. And we've got um, some of these other constraints might be, for example, torque limits. Uh, and we might have some, say, obstacle constraints. We can write like this. 
So it's just examples. Uh, cool. Okay, so what to say about this version? So this looks almost the same, right? It's just me plugging in my sort of like Runga-Kata method or whatever to discretize the dynamics and then using uh, some kind of quadrature rule to integrate the integral. So I get it into this little discrete guy. And now this is a finite dimensional problem, right? Because I have n time steps and now I have, I can stack all those into big vectors and, and that's kind of that. Uh, and now this, you can almost just stick this in a computer with a good commercial solver and just and just go, uh, which we'll do some of that later. Uh, some other sort of notes, uh, the samples, uh, X, K, U, K, these sample points in like control lingo, these are often called not points for weird historical reasons that I'm not 100% clear on. But uh, if you hear me say that, that is what I mean. Sample point, not point, it's, you know. Uh, just the lingo. And let's see, uh, some just kind of like, you know, basic stuff. So when we convert from continuous time to discrete time, uh, we use an integrator or, you know, some form of integration, right? To go from the ODE to, uh, to the discrete time dynamics and to go from that continuous integral to the sum, right? We're using integration. And this is sort of, you know, your Rangakata stuff. And then to go the other way, so let's say we have our nice continuous problem, we discretize it, we solve it in a computer, we get this discrete solution out of the computer. A lot of times we wanna convert that back to a continuous thing. We wanna maybe upsample it or, or whatever. And so going the other way, We, we do interpolation. So it's often common to use like cubic splines for this stuff and do cubic interpolation of the U of T and X of T to get stuff in between the sample points and that kind of thing. Okay, questions about any of this? Okay, moving on then. We're now gonna sort of dig into solving these things um and we're gonna sort of this is called pontryagin's minimum principle it's a thing you should know about it's part of you know control theory historically um i would argue it's not a super big deal but um it's not something to be scared of. It's really, um, it's just really in discrete time at least. It's totally just a restatement of the KKT conditions for this problem. So all we're gonna do is kind of take this guy, take its gradients and set them equal to zero and get KKT conditions. And the particular form flavor of those KKT conditions for this specific optimal control problem are called Pontryagin's minimum principle. So here we go. Um, notes on this, it's also called the maximum principle. If you maximize a reward, which is what you do in RL, right? Instead of minimizing a cost, this is one of the great divides between our two fields, whether you maximize rewards or minimize costs. Uh, incidentally, the original Pontryagin work from the 50s was maximizing reward. And so it's often historically been called the maximum principle. I feel like we should really just stick with Pontryagin's principle instead of specifying 
what kind of optimum it is. That would simplify life. Okay, so what this is, it's just first order necessary conditions. For the problem we just wrote down. And um, like in discrete time, you can do it in both discrete time and continuous time. We're gonna do it in discrete time and then I'll write down the continuous time version at the end, which looks exactly the same. Um, but deriving in discrete time, it's literally just the KKT conditions. It's a, you have to go through a lot of gymnastics to do it in continuous time with calculus of variations and fancy math, but uh, we won't do that. You can also get that result by just taking it a limit of the continue of the discrete time version. So uh, here we go. So given the problem we had before, and we're gonna sort of like simplify this down a tiny bit for, for this discussion, we're gonna look specifically at uh, this version of the problem with like no other constraints. Uh, stage cost, uh, terminal cost, and then discrete time dynamics like this. So no other, no other constraints, right? Just that. We're going to now, and I switched notice. Yeah, I should have been a little bit more careful about this before. I'm going to use little l's for the stage cost because I'm now going to use big L for the Lagrangian of you know, previous uh, optimization. Sorry about that. Don't confuse the L's. Okay, little L's, little L's are stage costs, big L's are Lagrangians. Okay, so conform the Lagrangian. Which is just like before, we're just going to take the cost function and tack on the constraints for the Lagrange multiplier. So here that is. So we got our stage cost. And we get now this Lagrange multiplier. And I'm going to do the indexing a particular way. It's not super important. You just have to you know, pick one convention and stick with it. So I'm going to make it lambda k plus one here. Uh, to go with the future x k plus one doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. And then we got our terminal cost. Okay. Everyone cool with that? Pretty straightforward. Okay. This is where it starts to get weird. So this is, you know, stuff we did already. The next move, we're going to define this new thing called the Hamiltonian. We're just doing this because this is historical, how this was done. It's sort of with some kind of weird analogy to classical mechanics, like Hamiltonian mechanics. I kind of don't like this because it's not really the right thing for the Hamiltonian from classical mechanics, but you know, this happened 70 years ago and I wasn't alive, so I can't really argue. Um, so just so you're like kind of, you know, you can read the papers and stuff. Um, this is what you will see if you go look this up. Um, so yeah, this. Okay. Hamiltonian, and that's, here's what that is. H of X U lambda equals the stage cost plus the Lagrange multiplier term. So it's sort of the thing inside the sum, right? We're gonna call that the Hamiltonian. 
Now we're just going to plug this into the Lagrangian. And now we're going to get the following thing. Um, I'll write this down and then I'll, I'll kind of talk you through it real quick. in brackets to make sure it's clear what we're summing over. And then we've got our sort of terminal stuff. And annoyingly, okay, so what did I just do? I, um, I plugged the Hamiltonian in, number one. And then the second thing I did to get this was I played a little index gymnastics trick where I pulled out the first H from the sum. So H you know, of X1, U1, Lambda two, I pulled that out of the sum and then I like rewrite the sum. Uh, so it starts at K equals two. And I sort of like pull out also this, uh, the lambda end term at the other end. So quick, quick question, how many lambdas are there? We talked about this before. So there's N states, there's N minus one controls, right? So I start at X1 and I need, the controls are sort of connecting the states, right? So there's N minus one controls. How many lambdas are there? N minus one, right? Because there's a dynamics constraint connecting every pair of not points, right? So there's N minus one, just like the controls. Okay, so that's sort of, yeah. That's why we start at lambda two there and go to lambda N. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, this is based, okay. So the question is, um, the indexing of the lambda uh, inside the sum and the minus sign thing. So what's going on there is I, I did this very deliberately. This indexing trick was is the whole reason I did it was so that I got a lambda k xk inside the sum. I did it on purpose to like sort of expose that in the sum because that's what I want the sum to look like for what we're going to do next. We take the derivatives. Um, fun fact, this indexing game I just played where I re-indexed the sum and like pulled the ends out. If you do this in continuous time, in the continuous time derivation, this ends up being integration by parts. So I don't know if someone wants to like derive that and show that, that'd be kind of fun bonus points, which is, yeah, it's a lot easier when you do it in discrete time. This is why we're not doing it in continuous time. Um, but yeah, I don't know, fun fact. So, okay, that, there's two things, right? I plug in the Hamiltonian and then I do this indexing trick where I pull one term out, re-index inside the sum. So I get the, basically, so I get the lambda time step, the lambda, K, X, K in there to line up with each other. All good with that? Everyone cool with that? Okay, so here we go. Next, what we're gonna do is the obvious thing, we're now just gonna start taking derivatives and setting them equal to zero to get first order necessary conditions, okay? So we're gonna do the X and Lambda ones first. Okay, so here we go. So we'll do partial L, partial lambda K. If I kind of, you know, look inside there in the sum, I'm just gonna get partial H, partial lambda K minus X K plus one, which just gives me back the dynamics constraint, which is what it should be, right? If I take the derivative effect to a lambda, I should get should get dynamics. Okay, so that's sort of nice, sort of easy. 
Now we'll do the X ones. So we get partial L partial XK equals partial H partial XK minus lambda K transpose. And if I kind of dig into the definition of H and sort of chain rule through, I get that this is partial stage cost, partial XK. So the gradient of the stage cost respect to state plus um, this Lagrange multiplier times the dynamics Jacobian uh, minus lambda K equals zero. Okay, so that's the, the stuff in the sum. And then remember we have this terminal N term outside the sum that we actually end up having a like special case. And that looks like the following thing. Okay, uh, so we'll talk more about these. I'm just writing them out for now. Yeah. Uh, so the X one ends up, it turns out the X one term like is, is sort of covered by that middle line. Does that, sorry, is, can you, yeah. yeah, the X one is the term right in front of that. So H of X one, U one, Lambda two is outside the sum. And then inside the sum, I start at two. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. So this is this is a, just a trick. I pull out the first term, and then I re-index inside. The reason is I want to get lambda k x k inside, and to do that, I do this little trick. Sound good? Okay. So yeah, literally that line is the same as this line here. This this L line, right? I'm just doing like substituting an H and then like reworking the sum slightly. Um, cause it makes the, the following results sort of cleaner. Um, okay. So that's those derivatives. And then the last thing is for the U's, which we haven't done yet. The standard way of writing this stuff is that we don't actually write the gradient equals zero condition for U. We explicitly write out the, um, the min. Does anyone know why we might do that? Hey, uh, professor. Yeah. Uh, before that, really quickly. So for the first er, uh, for the first partial derivative, uh, the DL over uh, del lambda n, why is it a minus x of n plus one? x k plus one, the first line. Uh, so that yeah. I mean, you can go back to just here if it's if it's unclear at all. Like this um, this guy. If I take the derivative with respect to like lambda k, uh, it's multiplying that dynamics constraint, right? So here, if I take partial lambda k plus one, I get f of x k u k minus x k plus one, right? Is that clear? This bottom line. Uh, could you could you say that one more time, please? Yeah. So here's the term with the the Lagrange multiplier and the dynamics constraint, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll take partial L with respect to a lambda, like that's the, what I get back is the dynamics constraint. Oh, oh, okay, okay. That's all it is. I'm just taking derivatives of this this Lagrangian thing. Um, I rewrote it down here in terms of this Hamiltonian nonsense, but like you know, don't don't worry about that. All it really it's still the same, you know, L up top. I'm just going to write some of these results in terms of the Hamiltonian because that's the standard thing in the literature. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm going to write the U part of this kind of explicitly. The reason is that. Um, this lets us put uh, constraints on the U minimization to handle torque limits, which are a super common thing. So this looks like UK equals argmin. Uh, I'm going to write it as like U tilde inside the argmin of HXK UK. Uh, or sorry, U tilde. Lambda K plus one subject to, um, I'm gonna write this, you know, kind of a funky way, which I will explain in a sec. So this is shorthand for 
So basically, yeah, subject to the torque limits. What this says, who's not seen notation like this before? Everyone, oh, everyone's seen this before? Set notations. This says that U tilde has to be in sort of the, the feasible set, which you know can be anything, but in our case, it's can basically be between U min and U max. Uh, Zach? Yep. Just for clarity, so is that a is that an arrow? Is that an is that an E? That is a set membership. Uh, okay. So in LaTeX, it's backslash in. So it said said as you know U tilde in big U or in the feasible set big U or something like this. Okay, and this you know this can be anything, but in our case, it's going to be you know. This kind of thing. You'll see that a bunch. I'll probably use it a bunch. So, uh, you know, we might as well get into it now. Okay, so this is the whole thing. Um, I'm now going to sort of just clean this up and summarize it a bit and rewrite it in terms of like the Hamiltonian pretty stuff. So we have, um, and, uh, uh, you know, so like I'm going to just slightly rewrite this. So here we go. Uh, xk plus one equals grad of the Hamiltonian with respect to lambda uh, which is just f of x okay and we have lambda k equals gradient of the Hamiltonian with respect to x xk uk lambda k plus one um, this if i kind of like chain rule into h is just gradient of the stage cost plus this um, dynamics derivative thing so partial dynamics partial x k transpose lambda k plus one this is sort of bad sorry let me scooch this over. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then we have the U stuff. She said, this is just, we're gonna just actually keep it in terms of this argument thing, which is the standard result. Um, assuming like I care about torque limits. If I don't have any torque limits, I can just write the derivative equals to zero there also. And we're gonna do that in a sec actually. Uh, that's the case on the LQR problem that we're gonna look at in a sec. And then the last one is that terminal condition, lambda n equals partial L final partial XN. Okay, that's the whole thing. Um, let me write it. I'm gonna write the continuous time version and then we'll talk through it a little bit. The continuous time version is almost identical. So no surprises. Almost identical, not surprising, but way more work to derive in continuous time. So we will just do it this way. Um, here's what it looks like. Basically replace Ks with dots and stuff, right? And these are the continuous dynamics now instead of the um, discrete dynamics. Hey, Zach, is that a negative lambda dot? Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a sec. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, all this basically looks the same. Uh, 
and then lambda of t final equals partial terminal cost partial x. Okay, let's see. Now, what do we talk about? Okay, cool. So, um, what do we say about these things? So, notes on these things. And we'll, we'll like kind of stare at these and, and talk about them a, a little bit. So first thing to say is um, historically people used these, uh, the continuous time versions actually. So in the dawn of optimal control and like the early space program years, that kind of stuff, um, people used these continuous time equations like you see here to figure out like rocket trajectories and stuff like that. Um, and they would basically you know, write the problem down, write those things down. Those are ODEs now, right? They're ODEs for X, you know, x dot and lambda of t, right? x of t, lambda t, and u of t. And you can write these things down and then like basically integrate them with a runga kata method. Here's a fun question. If I have some initial start state, you know, x naught, and I have some goal state, x final, I want to, you know, fly my rocket to. Um, so that's, you know, I started x naught, I integrate forward with the dynamics, that's clear. What about lambda? Do I know lambda naught at t equals zero? No. What do I know? If I just write down my cost function. Like what, what do I know about lambda? How do I get an initial condition to integrate lambda? Do I have an initial condition for lambda? Do I have something else? Look at the last line of these things. What's the last line tell me? Yeah, so from the, the last line tells me, I actually know lambda at the final time just from the cost function, from the terminal cost, right? Okay, so the, the kind of funny thing about this is I have an initial state for X naught at T naught, and I, I have a final lambda at T final, and I have ODEs for both. Um, but it turns out I end up having to integrate the dynamics for the states forward. And then I have to integrate the, the ODEs for lambda backwards in time from the final lambda. That's why the lambda dot has a minus sign in front of it. It's going backwards in time. Okay. So um, this is very, very closely related, in fact, to, to backpropagation in neural networks. Like this is basically the continuous time version of backprop. And that backwards integration of the lambdas is really basically equivalent to like backpropping through backpropping through time through the trajectory and continuous time, which is kind of fun and kind of interesting. By the way, yeah, like a lot of the neural net stuff has roots in optimal control going back to like the 50s to this stuff, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so okay, so that's that's kind of weird. Yeah. So you integrate lambda backwards, you have to do that iteratively. Yeah, exactly. So so the question was you have to integrate lambda backwards. Absolutely. So this um and this is why we're gonna write this down right now. So Methods that do this basically start with a guess for, for X naught and like the goal state, whatever. And you have to sort of integrate one forward and then one backward and they obviously don't match. And then you basically have to iteratively refine them and kind of keep making these forward and backward passes. This is very analogous, by the way, to like in modern RL methods, you have a forward rollout and then you do some back propagation of your gradients. Like that's essentially what's happening here. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know how to solve too many nonlinear first order ODEs, do you? Only in like one or two really benign. So for linear everything, yes. Uh, for anything nonlinear, pretty much no. Like I don't know how to solve really any nonlinear ODEs, you know? So, so yeah, you can, for like some extremely simple cases, solve these ODEs in closed form, namely the famous LQR problem, which is linear, but pretty much as soon as things are nonlinear, you, you can't solve those things, right? So you have to numerically integrate them and, uh, and cross your fingers, okay? So yeah, let's write this down. So yeah, basically, historically, um, Many algorithms would essentially start with a guess and integrate these things forward and backward.
um, to essentially, if you do this, you essentially end up end up doing uh, gradient descent, right? So these, remember, these things are the, the first derivatives. These are all the gradients, right, of everything. So essentially, if you keep iterating these things forward and backward with an ODE integrator, you, you end up doing gradient descent. on u of t. Uh, so these methods, these kind of old school methods are called uh, some combination of indirect, um, which refers to in optimal control lingo, if you hear anyone say indirect, what they mean is it's based on Pontryagin's principle, as opposed to direct methods, which are uh, straight up just kind of the original problem formulation uh, that we wrote down in discrete time. So if you just kind of solve that original formulation to discrete time, that's called direct. If you solve it via Pontryagin's minimum principle, it's called indirect. Indirect um, and or shooting methods. And the shooting refers to this idea of like starting at x naught and integrating forward and starting at lambda final and integrating backwards along the whole trajectory. That's called shooting in, in kind of the old school. We would call it a rollout probably now, right? Um, but I don't know, this is kind of an old word for, for that idea. Um, cool. Uh, also other fun facts, uh, in continuous time, you have a lambda of t trajectory, right? It's a continuous function, infinite dimensional vector. And that's called in the sort of parlance, it's called the co-state trajectory. Has anyone heard that before? And it's sort of, it, it is the same dimension as, as the state vector, right? That's kind of, um, and there's a sort of rich interpretation of this guy that we will talk about more. But we kind of need some more mathematical machinery to, to like sort of really grok what that thing is. Um, okay, so you can do it like this. Uh, people used to do it like this. I would say essentially no one uses this kind of like gradient descent e, you know, shooting indirect style method anymore. Um, you know, back in the 70s when computers were really kind of bad, this was like the best you could do kind of. Now we have way, way better ways of doing this with modern optimization tools. So um, we'll, we'll like, actually I'll show you this uh, in a bit just so you can like see what it looks like. And then I will sort of like mercilessly destroy it and show you how terrible it is compared to more modern techniques. Um, Okay. By what metrics is it uh, worse? Yeah, so in terms of convergence rate, numerical conditioning, uh, you know, sort of um, robustness to, you know, like convergence, you know, sort of like, uh, I don't know, performance on highly nonlinear things, you know, uh, just as a general kind of like optimization technique, they're really bad. Um, I mean, th these methods are basically doing like just kind of uh, gradient descent on you is what they really are doing, right? And so uh, naive gradient descent doesn't do so great. And there's, there's way better ways to, to optimize things, right? In particular, we're going to start looking at how to do Newton things, quasi-Newton things. Like we talked, we spent a whole bunch of time talking about Newton's method, right? So the obvious move is we don't really want to do gradient descent. We want to do Newton's method when we can, because it works way, way better. Okay, so that's that. We have like five minutes left. So in those five minutes, I think we'll keep trucking for a little bit. Um, we may end up having to repeat this next time to some degree, but yeah, we'll, we'll live with it. Okay, so uh, next thing we're going to talk about and we'll spend a lot of time on this. Uh, so is the, the famous linear quadratic regulator, also known as LQR. Who's done this before in some form, in some class? 
like a handful. Okay. So this has like, it's a lot to say about this. Well, let me write it down. And then I don't think we'll get too far on this today, but uh, we'll pick it up next time. So this problem is just a special case of what we've been talking about, uh, where the cost is a quadratic. And it's usually written like this, although you'll see like kind of some variations on the theme. So that's our stage cost. It's like X transpose QX, U transpose RU, the quadratic. And then we have a terminal cost that will kind of standard way would be like this, QN, XN. Uh, subject to linear dynamics. And in general, these can be time varying linear. So the A's and B's can be different at each time step K. Okay. Um, then there's some things to say about this cost function. So people who've done this before, uh, what are the requirements on the Q's and R's? That you have to have for this guy to work out and have a solution. Yeah, diagonal Sorry? Yeah, they have to be a diagonal no, no, they can be general dense uh, matrices. Almost. Yeah, okay. So um, for this thing to be convex, so we talked about with QPs, we want it to be kind of strictly positive definite, usually to have a unique solution. And then someone else, I think, um, Tim, you mentioned that it can be quasi-definite sometimes, or uh, what do you call it, a semi-definite, and that's sort of okay too. So it turns out in the LQR problem, we need um, Q to be positive semi-definite, and we need R to be strictly positive definite. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about this. That's to guarantee that the problem has a solution. If that's not true, then the problem might not have a unique solution, might not have you know, a, a sort of feasible solution at all. Um, let's see. Okay, so just to be clear, right, the cost function here. Um, the, so remember, we kind of talked about the whole beginning of this. We have our dynamics and we have our cost function. The cost function is our way of shaping the behavior of the system and sort of describing what we'd like the system to do, right? So what does this cost function tell, tell the system to do? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what this says to do is to drive the state to the origin and then stop, right? Like the minimum of this cost function is at x equals zero and, and u equals zero. So the goal here would be to drive the system from whatever starting state you're at to the, to the origin and then stop and like have no control anymore, right? So that's what this is like ideally asking for. And um, let's see, uh, in particular, right, you're like, by uh, choosing Q and R, what you're basically doing is weighting off how much you care about control effort versus how much you care about getting to the origin really fast, right? So if I have uh, Q like smaller and R really big, that's penalizing control effort a lot. So I'll probably get, I'll take my time getting to the origin, right? If I make Q really big and R really small, it's saying I really care about getting to the origin really fast, and I don't care if I use a ton of uh, control effort to do it, right? So I'll get really large use, and I'll get, you know, the state driving to the origin really quick. This kind of tells you why R has to be strictly positive definite, right? So if I had uh, R is zero, say, and I have a big Q in there that says get to the origin as fast as possible, what's the optimal thing to do? If there's no cost associated with, with the controls. Yeah, the optimal thing would be to basically jack you up to infinity and get there, you know, in zero time, right? So it sort of like becomes ill-posed. So that's why R has to be strictly positive definite. Um, what else is there to say about this? Okay, uh, some other notes. Um, the problem is called time invariant uh, LQR. If um, a k equals some constant a, uh, b k equals some constant b, uh, 
QK equals some constant Q, you know, RK equals some, I should put Ks on these guys, some constant R for all K. So if those things are constant matrices, they don't change at all in time, that's time invariant. And unsurprisingly, if it does vary, it's called time variant. Otherwise, uh, so on that, uh, again, so time invariant LQR is usually what we, we want when we're talking about stabilizing an equilibrium point. So if you're saying, you know, like keep the inverted pendulum upright and reject disturbances, uh, fixed equilibrium point, that's gonna be the time invariant LQR. If I want to instead track a trajectory that's a function of time, so I wanna track some swing up trajectory to get to the upward equilibrium, something like that on the pendulum, that would end up being time variant. So like kind of the, the standard way of understanding this, I would say is time invariant is keeping, staying at a fixed point, staying at an equilibrium point or something. And time variant is for tracking trajectories. Um, yeah, I think that's about time to stop. So I'll hang out for a bit if anyone has questions. Um, we will do lots more LQR uh, next time. Okay.